There are basically two kinds of receptors. Ionotropic receptors function as tiny holes in the membrane. You can think of them as little donuts that can either be closed or open. When the neurotransmitter molecule binds to an ionotropic receptor, it typically triggers the opening up of a tiny hole through which charge atoms or ions, such as sodium, chloride, or potassium, can flow into and out of the postsynaptic neuron. Metabotropic receptors, in contrast, don't typically directly open a tiny hole in the membrane, but rather trigger secondary signaling cascades inside the postsynaptic neuron that have relatively delayed downstream effects, including sometimes the opening of other receptors. In either case, the binding of neurotransmitter to a receptor leads to a change of the charge inside a postsynaptic neuron. In the case of ionotropic receptors, this change in charge will be fast. And in the case of metabotropic receptors, the changes in charge will tend to be slower. Let's focus on the fast ionotropic changes in charge inside the postsynaptic neuron. What's really changing when an ionotropic receptor opens and ions flow into and out of the neuron is that the difference between charge across the membrane changes. That is, the charge inside the neuron relative to the charge outside the neuron changes. This difference in charge is sometimes called voltage, and sometimes it's called potential. Basically, a difference in potential across the membrane tells you the degree to which ions will tend to flow one way or the other across the membrane in order to achieve equilibrium. A neuron would be at equilibrium when there is no difference in charge between the inside and outside of the membrane. This generally occurs only when a neuron is dead. When a neuron is alive, it actively keeps the voltage across its membrane far from equilibrium. This allows neurons to do important things like fire. Living neurons tend to have a negative resting potential. This means that even in the absence of input, neurons are far from equilibrium. In order to maintain a negative potential, there have to be more positively charged ions outside the cell than inside of it, or more negatively charged ions inside the cell than outside of it. This is accomplished by carrying out work. For example, so-called sodium pumps actively transport positively charged sodium ions from inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. It therefore takes expensive cellular energy to maintain this resting potential. It also means that any deviations from this resting potential tend to be brought back to this baseline resting potential within milliseconds or tens of milliseconds. When an ionotropic receptor opens, ions flow into and out of the postsynaptic neuron. If there is a net increase in charge inside the postsynaptic neuron, it is said to depolarize. And if there's a net decrease in charge, it's said to hyperpolarize. Depolarization is typically associated with neural excitation. That means that the neuron becomes more likely to fire an action potential. Conversely, hyperpolarization is typically associated with neural inhibition. That means that a neuron becomes less likely to fire an action potential. Let's say that the resting potential of a neuron is minus 70 millivolts. When an excitatory neurotransmitter, such as glutamate, binds to an ionotropic glutamate receptor, the pore opens and sodium rushes in. This leads to an increase in the net charge inside the cell. We can measure this bump up in potential as a so-called excitatory postsynaptic potential, or EPSP. But since the sodium pumps are actively pumping sodium outside of the cell, that EPSP will tend to decay in short order. Once it has decayed, the neuron returns to its baseline resting potential, and it's as if the EPSP never happened. However, if enough EPSPs happen, all within a relatively brief time known as the temporal integration constant of the neuron, then the EPSPs can sum up. So a neuron functions as a leaky integrator. It sums up EPSPs, but they decay away. So the EPSPs have to all arrive within a very short time window in order to add up. Otherwise, they would decay back to the baseline resting potential. Once that happens, it's as if the EPSP never happened. So another way to think of a neuron is to say that it forgets that it was ever excited once it has returned to its resting potential. Now, if EPSPs do successfully add up, and if the sum of EPSPs pushes the potential above the so-called firing threshold for the neuron, typically around minus 55 millivolts, then the neuron will fire an action potential away from the axon hillock down the axon. In fact, the final decision whether to fire or not is made at the axon hillock. If the firing threshold is reached at the axon hillock, then boom, an action potential is ballistically generated in an all or none fashion. There's no such thing as a partial action potential. It either happens or it doesn't.
However, a neuron can also be hyperpolarized by inhibiting inputs, typically triggered by the binding of a neurotransmitter molecule known as GABA to GABAergic receptors. If these inhibitory ionotropic receptors open, then the net ionic charge inside the neuron goes down or is hyperpolarized, bringing the neuron further away from the threshold for firing. There's a dynamic interplay between excitation or depolarization and inhibition or hyperpolarization. In this drawing, you can see how EPSPs add up and how, if they reach the firing threshold, how the neuron generates an action potential. You can also see here how IPSPs can add up and inhibit the cell, making it less likely to fire. Let's now look at what happens when an action potential is generated. You can see that initially, the net charge climbs massively above the resting potential. This is typically because positive ions, in particular sodium ions, rush into the postsynaptic neuron. But this change in voltage triggers the opening of other receptors, which lead to the net outflux of positive charge, typically an outflow of positively charged potassium ions, leading to this rapid collapse in potential here. After firing, a neuron's potential will often overshoot, descending below the resting potential. This leads to a refractory period during which the neuron is so hyperpolarized that it cannot fire. Once, when teaching an introductory neuroscience course, I thought I had hit upon the perfect metaphor to explain how neurons fire. I said that they function sort of like a toilet in that there's a threshold beyond which they ballistically fire and that there is a refractory period after having flushed when a toilet cannot be flushed again before returning to baseline. But after class, I realized the problem with my metaphor because one student wanted to know what the thing was that was sent down the pipe of the axon. At this point, I realized that I had mistakenly implied that an action potential is, by analogy, a concrete thing, but it's not. It's a pattern of energy or a disturbance, more like a wave than a physical thing. In fact, it's a wave of ionic flux into and out of the axon that travels down the axon between one meter per second and for very large axons as fast as 100 meters per second. Metaphors are useful but dangerous. They can help us understand something that we do not understand in terms of something that we do understand, but they can also be dangerous if we take them too far.